Hello, everybody. My name is Dan Skip Allen, and this is the 52 Must See Movies and Why They Matter. Season number two, and returning along here. And uh, on this episode, we're going to be talking about the first great comic book movie that has ever happened. I mean, this genre has really broken out in the last 10 or 15 years, but this is the first one. This is the one, the daddy of them all, the granddaddy of them all. They always say in, uh, you know, uh, football games, college football, the granddaddy of them all. This is the granddaddy of them all. This is the one that really set the stage for what we're going through now in comic book movies. And it's the original 1977 Richard Donner Superman starring Christopher Reeve. Um, with me this evening, uh, the man who nominated this, so we could talk about this, is Mr. Sandy, the Sandman Robinson. Sandy, how are you doing today? Hey, Dan, thanks so much for having me. You know that, I mean, you know this, and most people that have uh, seen me, uh, you know, whether or not it's in matches or anything like that, have uh, known and come to know my love for Superman, so I really do appreciate you having me on for this. Hey, yeah, no, uh, uh, you know, when, we, when we're thinking about the list and what we're going to nominate, what we're going to have, and, you know, some other things came up, and I was like, no, we're not nominating those. We're going to nominate Superman because that's the movie that started it all. And the thing is, it stands up today still 30 to 41 years later, I believe. What 19, Was it 78 or 77? I think it was – and yeah, no, it was December of uh, December uh, initial released on December tenth, nineteen seventy eight. So it's forty years later. This movie still holds up today, and I will argue with anybody that says it doesn't. So um, the cast, obviously, I already mentioned um, Christopher Reeve as Clark Kent, Superman; Margot Kidder as Lois Lane; Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor; Ned Beatty as Otis. Uh, I can't remember the actress that played Mrs. Tessmacher. I loved her. Also, you have Billy uh, Olson. I can't remember. I didn't write his uh, actor. But we have some supporting actors as well. Uh, Marlon Brando plays Jarrell. Um, Terrence Stamp in a small role as Zod. Uh, who else do you have? Do you have any other um, – Anybody yeah. want to mention or just want to go and, and, and just, what do you think about this cast? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'll just mention, I'll just run off some of the ones that you touched on, but miss the Mark McClure played Jimmy Olsen through like the whole series uh, of movies. So, you know, he's classically known uh, in that character. Jackie Cooper is Perry white, you know, old time, you know, old time movie star came in, you know, at the end of his career and, you know, really played a good Perry white. You were talking about miss Tessmacher, Valerie Perrin, uh, did, uh, did her and she played, it marvelous marvelously um you mentioned you know the small little teaser that we got of uh of terrence stamp and the rest of his uh the rest of zod's little crew um you know right at the beginning there uh which sets up perfectly for 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 the sequel um but overall yeah i mean you know you get you get a star like marlon brando you know to start the whole movie off and you, you touched on something that you know that it still holds up yeah it really, it really does. Like I, I watched it again for probably the hundredth time, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago and the special effects, they're there, you know, the, the, the acting, you know, nowadays movies can sometimes rely too much on special effects. I know we've talked about that, you know, before about, you know, how heavily, heavily movies rely on that stuff. Superman was one of the first to really, to, to, to really, person to person special effects like the flying and, and things like that yeah sure there was drop cloths and, and back screens and stuff like that 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 they used uh, you know through a long time but to get those type of special effects back done in 1978 i mean you got to remember star wars had just come out so it really changed the, the 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 landscape of what you could do visually and that really i think helped superman you know really push that envelope and really you know the tagline of course everybody knows it was you'll believe a man can fly and i walked out of that theater believing I could fly, you know, like, I, I don't think I took a, I don't think I took a towel off of the back of my neck, you know, for, uh, for, for, for a week after that until my mom probably ripped it off of me. But, um, yeah, it, it a hundred percent holds up. So I, I'm, I'm excited to dive right into this. 
Yeah, so uh, you mentioned um, Terrence Stamp and Marlon Brando. Uh, we we start out on Krypton, which I, I tell you what, the sets, I, I love the sets. Um, but obviously, um, we have the trial of Zod and his crew, and they're um, the the floating heads, guilty, guilty. Oh, oh my God, some neat stuff for the time period. Really, it was kind of really interesting for the time. And of course, you know, Terrence Stamp, he ends up, his whole crew ends up in the Phantom Zone, which is at this time is a mirror. But I would say interesting way to do the Phantom Zone, you know, because you don't know how you don't know how they were gonna do that, pull that off. You know, that was kind of a cool way to do it. Um and then um Jarrell, you know, he's trying to tell these elders, hey guys, God, we got some problems there. And so what he ends up doing is putting his little baby in a cape or a blanket or whatever you want to call it in a little spaceship and shooting him off into space. And he tells his wife, with the red sun of Earth, he will be a god. He will be a god amongst men. Um, hopefully, you know, he, we will instill, we have inst instilled in him the right way and the right things to do. You know, with the with the um, when he falls to Earth, we have the, obviously the palace, the um, fortress of solitude. But we'll get into that. So, what do you think about the beginning of the film? So, yeah, I, I mean, you know, that whole, like that whole beginning, the trial and 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 then the destruction of Krypton with Jarrell sending Kal El out to out to space to you know to to go to Earth. Um, you know, with as much research as I've done, you know, with Superman over the time and the, the invention of the internet is, you know, really made that an awesome thing that you can just delve right into the deepness of of some of the the deep cuts. You know, Richard Donner uh, was is a fantastic director. And, you know, and, and what he was able to do with the look of Krypton, uh, with the limited budget that he was uh, that he was given for this movie. Um, is remarkable because it looks so alien. It looks so different than than our own culture. So to see all the glowing columns and 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 to know how that was accomplished, it's uh, it's 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 great to look at and to see somebody's imagination pop on screen like that. Um, Marlon Brando, you know, like him playing Jor El and and just added that wisdom. You know, like added that wisdom. And you know what, he he was the calm, right? Because you you could see that Lara was didn't want to give her kid up, right? Didn't want to give her, you know, like, no, but, you know, listen, it's not like we're sending him to some savage planet where he's going to have to face for himself. We're sending him to a relatively, relatively civilized, uh, you know, place. And the yellow sun is going to fill his, you know, his veins with the, the radiation that will make him, like you said, godlike. Um, and we can only do what we can do to give him the information and give him the the education and you know this kind of jazz that we can give to him to instill in him what turns him into the the universe's greatest hero absolutely so um then the little spacecraft crashes to earth and it lands in um kansas and of course driving down the road is ma and pa kent and they see it and they go up to it and of course it's a little boy and they don't have any children and of course my kids like this is a re there was a reason why he landed here you know we needed you know we were meant to have him and um of course you know then they fast forward to when he's a teenager um, of course before before that he's a little baby and the truck they have to change the tire on the truck and he He's an old man. Pa Kent's an old guy, so he can't really do. It. The little baby goes up, and he lifts the truck up, and they knew something special. They knew there was something special about this little baby boy. And fast forward to when he was a teenager in high school, you know, he see he's looking out there, and he sees all the kids playing football, and he knows he can't play football, and because of his abilities, he, he's not meant to play football. And um, you see him, he's racing, he's racing the train and, and, and his mom, ma, his mom, ma, ma, ma Kent goes, you weren't meant to play football. You, you were meant for something greater. 
And this is kind of they he ended up in with this family, a family of very good values and that taught him right from wrong in the way of life on earth at the very beginning, which is a good thing for this little boy. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, there's been numerous comics that have come out since then of like, you know, like red, like Superman, red sun, you know, and things like that. Like what if Superman, like what if Kal-El's little craft would have gone somewhere else, Russia. Germany, Russia, you know, like places that in history around this time weren't the nicest places to be. And somebody like Kal-El could be completely, you know, brainwashed into believing that this was the right way you know, to live your life. Um, you know, it's that, that, that first scene where, you know, where the, the truck crashes and then Pa Kent gets underneath the truck and he's trying to jack it up and, and it's not on good ground and he's sitting there trying to remove that tire and it crashes like the, the jack you can see slipping and it just jacked, but he's sitting there wincing and nothing, you know, the, 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 the 10, you know, three ton truck doesn't fall on him. Um, and you know, there's little naked Clark, <laughs> you know, holding up the truck saying, I got it. Don't worry. Um, you know, like you knew that, yeah, it, it, he was something special at that point, but it doesn't matter if it was some other country, it could have been New York city that it landed in. It could have been, it could have been LA. And, and what, what kind of values would he been, would have been instilled with at that point? You just don't know. Right. But because he landed in the Midwest, he landed in those old school val you know, human values, parenting values, they were able to instill in, into Clark right from the beginning that this is how you treat people. This is how you want to be treated. This is what you do. If you can help, you help. If you can't, you do whatever you can. Um, you know, and, and, and once again, it's what raised Clark to be the person he is. Yeah. And almost every iteration we've seen on the screen, Clark has wanted to play football at some point in time and no, <laughs> you know, no, you, you can't, you're just, you're, you're too strong. All you have to do is get into the heat of moment, man. I mean, you and I are hockey fans. You, you know, what can happen, in, you know, in the, in the split second with somebody with a stick. Can you imagine Superman losing his cool for a second? <laughs> you know, like there you go. The, the entire team is wiped out with one laser blast. Right. So no, you, you hit it right on the head. You, you, you know, he landed in the right place at the right time with the right people to start. Because Superman isn't all about this. It's about here. And when you've got one, a good, a good one of these, you you generally try, tend to do the right things, no matter what kind of power you have. Yeah. And um, so then, um, unfortunately, Pa Kent dies and we have the funeral. And, of course, you know, this really hurts Clark a lot. Um, then he ends up finding, um, going into the barn, and he, he goes to his ship, the ship that he landed on Earth, and he found a, crypt, a crystal. And he also found kryptonite. And, he, and this leads him to the Fortress of Solitude, where he gets, gets some mentoring from Jarrell, um, Marlon Brando. This basically leads us into his adulthood, where we see him go join the Daily Planet. Um, so he has to kind of disguise himself, and he and he chooses this disguise of Clark Kent. So, what are your thoughts about the these sequences? Well, first off, it, Jeff East is the is the actor who played young Clark Kent, um, his teenage years when he left with the you know yeah with the, with the crystal to uh, you, you, to create the uh, the fortress. Uh, not, not enough can be said about like I know he gets over you know overshadowed by you know Marlon Brando before him, and then he's got this amount of space, and then it's Christopher Reeve for the rest of the time, right? Um, but he really brought a humanity to I think that that younger Clark like. I got to go out and find who I am. Like, I got to, you know, who am I? Where did I come from? Who sent me here? All that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so yeah, when he, when, when the crystal calls to him and, and says, you know, we're ready to teach you, 
you just have to follow the path and he goes and he follows the path and it takes him, you know, all the way to the Arctic circle and he wings, he finds nothing. And then he wings that crystal out there and it creates the fortress and he goes in there and yeah. And then Jarrell starts speaking up and he learns his lesson. He gets start getting, he starts getting his, his, his lessons. And the next thing we see is, you know, like him coming out of that, you know, that crystal, that crystal cavernous fortress of solitude. And, uh, and he's the person that we expect him to be. Um, so I think it gets, I think the, I think that we don't, we, I don't know if we got enough of it. Like, I don't know if we got enough of young Clark in the, in the movie. Uh, there's some things that we'll probably talk about a little bit later that you probably could have shortened a little bit to give us a little bit more of that journey that he went on. Uh, like in Man of Steel, like when like the whole beginning is pretty much relegated to that progression of what Clark has to do to become the person that he's in. I, I would say the first hour at least is is, is dedicated to that. Um, but overall, it's a great little it's a great origin. Like, I mean, it's a great origin story. It, the, the first begin the beginning part of this movie is a great origin story. And they didn't they didn't let it drag. As, as as what they could have it just moved you know like so i i agree with you i think that uh yeah i think that that's a pivotal pivotal scene and they could have made it be they could have made it cheesy but they didn't they made it as realistic as they could of course he ends up working for the daily plan uh daily i almost said daily plan uh <laughs> daily bugle um and he meets <laughs> Lois lane and Jimmy Olsen and Perry White, who will become integral parts of his life uh, because he's going to work there and he's going to end up eventually falling in love with with uh, Lois Lane. And of course, Jimmy Olsen is his buddy. You know, he, he, he you know, they they're like together. You know, he's a writer and he's a photographer and they work together a, real, a lot. So they become pretty buddies. And of course, Perry White, you mentioned earlier, uh, the actor. He, he, he comes across as a, that kind of newspaper guy, that guy that would be the editor of a newspaper uh, in New York City. He really captured that essence of that character. Um, so also there's a stick up. We get to, we get to see um, Superman in action. There's a stick up and he basically takes out this, this guy because he captures the bullet and knocks the guy out. Um, then we start getting to see the bad guys. Uh, Otis, you know, he's just walking down the street. He's eating his donut or bagel or whatever he's doing. And we see where he ends up. He ends up taking this interesting route through the train station and through the tunnels of the of the New York train um, underground train. Um, and um, he ends up getting tailed by a police officer. So when he gets into his base of operations, we get introduced once again. We get introduced to Lex Luthor and Mrs. Tessmacher. And of course, Lex is like, you were tailed again. And he has little tricks out in the tunnel, which the, the police officer is like, hey, I think I know where they're at. And then he just pushes him out in the middle of a train and he's killed. The cop is killed. So uh, these introductions and the beginning of our kind of introduction of our villain and, and some of our main characters, I, I really thought they did. I mean, I'll tell you what, this movie really does a lot of things really good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll touch on a couple of things that you, that you brought up the, um, the introduction of Clark kent uh to the daily planet and him seeing all that stuff N not enough is said about christopher reeves clark kent portrayal um he is so bumbling and on purpose you know because we see it several times throughout the series you, you know where he's like he takes his glasses off and you can he's super mad at that point and just was like shaking his head like i have to be this this moron you know and 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 like to make sure nobody because this isn't my job this isn't what this isn't who i am this is who i am I, this is the, you know the other guy um you know and, and 
you know, you, you first meet Lois and she's this like power forward. She's just moving, you know, to the net as quick as she can. She's just, you know, she's all over the place. She's a true newswoman, you know, and, and, and Jimmy, you know, his sidekick, you know, you, you tell the stories, I'll take the pictures, buddy. And, you, you know, and just goes out there and doesn't, he puts himself in danger all the time just to get that shot. Right. And, and that's what a good photographer does. And yeah, Perry White, he's that, He's what you expect to see when you roll into a 1970s, early 80s newspaper and you see those guys that have been around since, you know, before, you know, and 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 doing that stuff. Um, but then we'll, then we get into, like you said, we get into the bumbling Ned Beatty character, Otis, you know, wandering around trying to lose the tail that he's got and, and not even noticing that he's got one again. And I think, especially with it being one of the very first comic book movies like really really adapted from a comic book um not enough can be said about how innocently evil lex luther is like they didn't go whole hog and it wasn't like <laughs> you know like that typical old serial villain and stuff like that he was smart like and in my in my opinion the best lex luther that's ever been on screen uh, that's my opinion. Gene Hackman played it perfectly. And yeah, like to go into that layer in the subway and then to just him, he were followed again, hit that button and you see like the, the, the wall just close off and chuck those guys over onto the, onto the thing. It's all, all about timing because if he'd have done that two minutes earlier, the cops would have got off, jumped off of things and be like, Oh, that sucked. And then they would have been down there with a SWAT team. Um, but it was perfect timing. He's like, looking. he's like, uh, yeah, right about now. And, and in our jaded, you know, adult perceptions, you sit back and you go, man, he just killed two cops. But you don't think about it that way because it wasn't done in a typically evil manner. It was just that was what he was doing to not get found. And as adults, we can go, man, he just killed two cops. <laughs> you know, there's like, there's that's bad. You don't do that kind of stuff. So yeah, like not enough could be said on, on how Chris Reeves played clark not just superman but played clark and how awesome lex luther like gene Hackman is at lex luther yeah and i had um i had it in my notes bumbling bumbling uh clark kent and i forgot to say it so i'm glad you uh, brought that up yep. um and now we get to see the real superman what we, we we haven't really got a chance to see superman in action in a very famous scene, uh, the helicopter scene, and Lois lands in the helicopter, and something happens to the helicopter. It breaks. Um, so Superman has to come and save the helicopter, but also save Lois Lane. And we get the famous line, you got me, who's got you? Uh, yeah. I, I just, this is very, I think what a great line that was. It's a, you're, you're right. In moviedom history, it's, if you look up the top 100 quotes in movies, um, it's not there, but it should be um, because there, and it gets overlooked a lot, but that first time that Clark, I mean, we know he's got powers. We saw him earlier in the, in the movie as a young kid. So we know he can move fast. We know he can jump. We know he's got strength. We knew that. But that first scene where the wind picks up and takes that takes that helicopter and careens it off the top of the you know the the empire or the the Daily Planet and they're just hanging there and Clark is outside and he's looking up because something fell down and he picks it up and I I think it's Lois's shoe and uh, and and he's looking and then he looks up he's like uh oh and he runs down the street a little bit and he goes for a phone booth and it's like one of those little half phone booth and he looks at it and he's like ah. If he was Deadpool, he'd have just given you the fourth wall and just shaken his head and moved on. But no, he he moved on. And he found another one, and that's you get. And then he takes off, and you know, you know, he gra grabs Lois because she falls. And I don't care. I've listened to all the physics people say, "Oh no, he would have ripped her in half." I don't, uh, I don't care. You know what? It doesn't matter. It was the heroic thing to do. He saved her, and then of course the helicopter comes down. And he just grabs it and keeps on going up to the top. And yeah, you're lying. You know, like, you, I, don't worry, I've got you. You've got me. Who's got you? Uh, perfect Lois Lane, right? Like, I'm in danger falling to my death, but I'm still going to be a reporter and I'm going to ask you a question, <laughs> you know, and 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 do that. So I 100% uh, I agree with you. That's It's one of the most important scenes in movies. 
It really is. It's I mean, it's underrated how good um, uh, Margot Kidder is as Lois Lane in this in this franchise of films. Yeah. Um, this is where we're going to talk about we're going to talk about this gentleman a few more times because we've got a few more movies where he does the score of some of these movies that you guys have nominated on season two of the 52 must see movies and why they matter. But this is really where the score of this film just jumps out at you. No pun intended. Uh, John Williams, Superman score. Uh, you know, I'm really good at whistling it. I mean, just talk about the score of this film. John Williams is a composer a little bit uh, before we move on here. Yeah, no, uh, you do not have to convince me to talk about John Williams, the master him himself. Uh, this particular theme song, yeah, as 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 great as your whistling was, this uh, th this theme song doesn't start with the fanfare. It starts with that. It starts with that little bass pump that you've got going on there. And so you know something is happening because it eventually crescendos up a little bit. It gets a little louder and a little faster. And then it's do 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 do. And whoosh, you know, the shirt coat, the, the 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 jacket comes off and then 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 and it goes, you know, and then dun, 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 and then you get the fanfare. It is my favorite piece of movie. Um piece of movie uh composer uh it, it is it, it is my absolute favorite piece of music um i listen to it whenever i'm in whenever i'm down it's it, i've got it on my little on my phone and whenever i'm down i just hit it and it's like and i just and i just lose myself in it and i listen to the whole thing and it just puts me in a good mood it doesn't matter where i am it doesn't matter what i'm doing it doesn't matter where i'm seeing it it doesn't even have to be on superman the minute that song comes on for anything I am just happy. And John Williams, he is one of, if not the best, at capturing the mood of a movie and what you need to become engaged with those characters. And when that song comes up, you are 100%, yeah, get him, Superman, get him. You know, you are on board for it. You want to you wanna do exactly what I just did. You just want to pull your shirt apart and, and hope there's an S there and, 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 and jump up into the sky and save people. And that's the power of music and power of John Williams. And we saw, we've seen it with Jaws. We've seen it with Star Wars. We've, and, and as his career has progressed and the multiple amounts of movies he's done, you, you get you get it when you listen to it you get it if you've never heard it before and you've never seen it before you're missing out absolutely it's it's phenomenal and john williams is i mean I, I have talked about this when i did jaws last year you know i grew up with uh john williams because um i'm from boston obviously and we used to go to the esplanade and we used to watch every fourth of july pops goes the fourth and he was a conductor of the boston pops and uh it was. You know, I just got lucky. That's where I was from, and I got to experience that as a child growing up. And that was one of the few good moments in my life when we got to go to uh, Pops Goes the Fourth and got to listen to John Williams. So that's why he, he he really resonates with me so much. All these films in this era in the '70s and '80s are just phenomenal um, scores. And Superman, you might be right. This might be the best one. He's done so many great ones. It's hard to compare. You know, Star Wars is great, but we'll get into Star Wars another time. Uh, so then we get a little bit of a kind of like a, a multitude of scenes where Superman's being Superman, and he um, he he uh, saves a plane. He stops some crook, crooks on a boat, and he sees this guy crawling up a window trying to rob this place. <laughs> And he stopped. So then we get we get Superman being Superman, which is good because I think even though he, he he saved Lois and he saved the helicopter and stuff, we didn't really get him being super except when he, you know, he he was being robbed himself and he ended up stopping that crook. But uh, that's kind of fun to see him doing the Superman things. We come to uh, we come to get used to him doing. Well, and and yeah, you're absolutely right. Like the minute he saves Lois and puts that, you know. And, and puts that helicopter down and puts her down on two feet. And, and she's like, 
who are you? And he's just like, and he takes off and he flies and you see him flying all over the city. And then he, and he's listening, he's listening to hear it. And you're right. Yeah. He goes and he stops, uh, you know, he stops, uh, you know, a, a boat chase and lifts the boat up and drops it off at the police station. So he's doing the big things. He saves the plane, you know, he, so he's doing the big things like fly. Nope. Don't, don't look outside. Just fly. And you know, like that's one of the best scenes because you got that, like they're all just looking out the little tiny window and seeing Superman waving while he's holding up that plane with the engine. And then he does the little things, you know, like the guy that's like climbing up the wall. He's like standing there and the guy's like, what? And he falls over and he goes and saves him, you know, and does that. But he also saves that cat for that little old lady. Like he goes it, you know, like it does little, he just swoops down, yoink, he picks up, you know, and he's like, have a nice night, ma'am. And just uh, he does the little things because in Clark and, and, and Kal-El's mind, a hero is not somebody that just shows up for the big events. A hero is somebody that shows up whenever they're needed. And as long as he can do that. And I think that, you know, when we when we wrap this up, I think that, it, you know, that it'll come into play. That that's the tough thing about being a superhero is that it's easy to show up for the big events. It's if you're not there for the little ones, because that's what builds the people's trust, right? Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You're right. And it builds trust with the audience watching the movie as well. Yep. Um, and then, of course, Lois is like, well, you know, I need to get an exclusive interview with Superman. And so Superman agrees to, I don't know what you would call it. It's a date slash interview. Um, and he shows up and basically takes, takes Lois, who's all dressed up, um, on a nice flying around. They just decide to go flying around and he accidentally drops her and he has to go down and get her and she's screaming. And, uh, then after, after he takes her back, then of course, Bumbling Clark shows up and they have to go on in their date. <laughs> so it's like two kind of sides of a coin here we got superman it's like oh my god it's super then we got bumbling clark that shows hey let's go to a movie or something and, and you're you're absolutely right date or interview is uh is with the question mark at the end of it you know because i i still think one of the you know he starts talking about his powers because she's in interview mode at at that point and 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 then they get to the the you know to to the x-ray vision and uh she goes behind that wall and she's like, can you tell what uh, color uh, underwear I'm wearing? And, you know, he's like, uh, no. And then he reveals that, of course, he can't see through lead. And then she moves, you know, a couple of minutes later, she moves away and he's like, pink. <laughs> you know, and, and, and she's like, oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> she moves back behind the wall. And yeah, I mean, a lot of people say that the, you know, the flying scene where they're, you know, talking and she's, you know, reciting the poetry and, you know, all that kind of jazz and the little fingertip touching where they eventually stop touching and she plummets to her, you know, to down, down there. Um, I think that's just character building. Like, you know, it, it might have been a slower part of the movie and, you know, but I mean, you need those breaks. You can't be going balls to the walls every, you know, every single second. If you're going to make a good movie, you have to have those little breaks where you're character building and world building. And that's what that was. And it starts you feeling about this. You have to make sense earlier on what happens at the end or else it makes no sense. So that bit of world building has to happen. Absolutely. Um, then... Out of nowhere, we just get Mrs. Tessmarker in a car, and she gets into a car, car crash, and um, she's out on the ground. Of course, the firemen and everybody shows up, but Otis, he's sneaking around, trying to get. I don't know how he does it, or what you know how they knew to go to this specific place and crash and act act this whole scene out but he ends up getting um some missile codes uh some launch codes um from where these guys were and so um this ends up being a pivotal scene because jimmy and lowers are there to do some pictures of some reporting of, of this dam um uh I believe they're they're over there by this dam in, in the uh, Grand Canyon, that area. Uh, uh, so this is how we finally get the bad guy to step up and start 
revealing some of his plan, which is Lex Luthor. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, every great villain needs a reason to be a great villain. And even though he was, you know, always the the master of, you know, the behind the scenes and pulling the strings to do what he wants and, and to get as ahead as he's gotten, when Superman shows up, well, guess what? You know, all of a sudden, every crook in the universe is like, uh oh, we're right, except for Lex. He's like, no, nah, I got, I, I can, I can handle this. I got a plan for this. I, I've got, I've got to deal with this, and it's not going to stop my plan. My plan is that I want to take these to do this, and you'll know about my plan a little bit later. Um, and yeah, you get to, you get to the dam, and you know something big is 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 going to happen. You know, because of that. But it's just the amount of the amount of planning that goes into, and because the planning had already been this far, he had to come back and then plan again because now you had the you know the the introduction of Superman. So there was a well, you can't do what he was going to do with that person now in the world. You can't just do that. So you had to come back and then create your whole plan again just because of that. And once again, that brings into you know how awesome a villain lex luther is because he's not just like okay well let's just keep going forward and hopefully we get lucky fingers crossed nah he doesn't take nothing for luck so yeah. and what happens at, you know going forward you know you'll see how much planning he does and then uh another little scene which is kind of a throwaway line of dialogue um i think perry white brings it up or somebody says hey there was a meteorite stolen from a um a museum and you think, oh, well, meter up stolen from a museum. Nah. Then we get a secret um, frequency that only cats and dogs, and we get the dogs barking, we get the dogs barking, uh, can hear. But Superman can hear because he's got Superman hearing, super hearing. And it's Lex, and he says, hey, you know, I know if I try to get you to come visit me, Da, 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 you wouldn't come visit me. So I have a plan and this is what's going to happen. And um, I have nuclear launch codes or whatever. I think he tells them he's got the nuclear launch codes. He's going to fire off a rocket or whatever. And so this is how he lures Superman to his lair. But we find out what happened with that meteorite. Who happens to own the media right now? Uh, because it's a trap. Lex Luthor lures Superman to his lair as a trap because he knows the only way for him to do his plan is to find a way to incapacitate Superman. Neutralize. Neutral neutralize, whatever you want to call it. So um, what do you think about all this? Yeah, so I mean, you know, him coming over that frequency is brilliant. You know, Superman, right now there's a bomb somewhere in the city, and I have the I have the only detonator. And so he drills him, he spins, you know, we see another power, and he spins down and goes down into the subway. He's using his ears, you know, all the guns and the freeze and the heat and stuff like that. All tests set up by Lex to see just how powerful he is. But eventually he gets there and breaks the door open, which is awesome because it's like this, you know, two foot thick steel door and he just, you know, hits it twice and it, and it goes in there. So once again, a test that's set, you know, for Lex to be able to judge just what he's dealing with here. And yeah, you're hundred percent right. It's, and it's the best because he's like, because he's all like, you know, he, he moves towards this box and he's talking about it. And then, yeah, he starts, he goes to the map and he's like, and he tells him the whole plan and you're sitting there going, why are you telling him the whole plan? You're you're doing what every stupid bad guy in the war, in the history of comics has ever done. Hey, this is what I'm gonna do, and you can't stop me. Um, you know, and yeah. So then he's like, and I'm the only one with the with the with the, the detonator, and he sits on this that that box, and you know he can't. You know, Clark or Superman does his little scan with his things, and the only thing he can't see in is this box that Lex is sitting beside. And he's like, yeah, you thought that lead would stop me, blah, blah, blah. And he goes over there and rips the box open. And guess what it is? Our missing meteorite. And all of a sudden, weak as a kitten is our pal Superman. And it once, like, I, I can't say it enough. Once again, it shows us just how devious and how thoughtful 
Lex is about his plan that he's not going to take anything for granted and neither should anybody else. But somebody is kind of, he says that one of, one of the bombs that he's got off, he's got, he's got two missiles and one's going to go to the East coast. And one's going to go to the West coast. One's going to go to the San Andreas fault. line. Guess who happens to be in California over by this dam over by the Grand Canyon, by the San Andreas Fault Line, Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane. Mm -hmm. But he says one little thing too many. He should never have said one of the bombs is going to go to New Jersey. And somebody's mother lives in New Jersey, and that is Mrs. Tessmacher. And so she's like, no, I don't want my mom to die. So even though Lex is like, come on, Mrs. Tessmacher, let's go, she kind of circles back around and goes and helps. You're going to save my mom first, right? You're going to save New Jersey, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And then she kisses him. Then she takes the necklace of kryptonite off or the meteorite. And she says, why'd you kiss me? Well, I, I didn't think you would let me kiss you afterwards. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then, of course, Superman's off saving the day, saving New Jersey. And But the big one is... He's, he heads to California where Lois is in all kinds of trouble. Jimmy is in all kinds of trouble. Um, saves saves a bus, saves a train, saves Jimmy from falling off the dam. Um, Lois is trapped in the car. He saves her. But only after he does something that I don't think anybody could have expected. He turns back time. He turns the planet so he could go back and save Lois so she doesn't die because she's crushed in a uh, – when the, the fault line ooh, it crushed, her car fell down in it, and she was crushed in her car. Superman turns the planet backwards, goes back and saves Lois before she could fall into the crater. And um, – this is kind of something that shows the human side of Superman because this guy is not supposed to show emotion. He's not supposed to think about any one person over another, he, he, even though he saves Jimmy and whatnot, and he saves all these different people and all these different accidents over there in California by the dam and stuff. And he saves these people because all the water is rushing down to this, these condos or these these, these uh, apartments that are below the dam, and when the dam cracks, it's all this water. He just creates a little bit bigger um, avalanche of rocks, and they just build up to where the water hits up against them, and it stops the water from destroying these, these apartments and these condos. Um, talk about those sequences, because uh, that turn back the, the planet, turn back the time was really – interesting to me yeah no absolutely well okay so we'll, we'll jump back to the to the miss test mocker uh, in the in superman in the pool um it's really it's it's really important to make make sense that it was he, superman told everybody during that interview you know what who he was as a person and one of the things that he said was that he never lies so that's why miss test mocker was all you know like if you promise that you'll go and save my mom in Jersey first, uh, I'll know you mean it because you never lie. And so that, and so he's forced at that point to say, okay, in order to save all of these other people, I have to save all these people as well, which he wants to do. But of course he's sitting back going, well, I got to save Lois because that's where she is, you know, and, and, and he's thinking, like you said, very humanly, you know, thinking about that. So it's important to know that, yeah, the, he has a sensibility that, what if he'd have lied to her? She was the bad guy. Who would have known? Well, he would have known. And that's the most important thing is that he made a promise and your promise is only as good as your promise is kept. And yeah, did it cause issues? It sure did. You know, it took that little bit of time out and that little bit of, you know, extra, those extra couple of seconds, um, you know, that, that, that were really all that important. Um, and then, yeah, we go, you know, so he stops the first missile and then he goes he, off to Santa or off to California, the fault line, he goes and fixes it. He goes under the ground and he, and he fixes everything and pushes everything back up to save the millions. So, I mean, we can sit back and say, well, you know, he's thinking human when it comes to Lois and all that kind of stuff. 
but he went and he did his job first. You know, Lois was just the, the camel, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And that caused him to, of course, go and, and, and do, you know, like she fell in that crevasse and, and then the, the, you know, the, the rock slide just kept pouring in, pouring in. She couldn't get out. She couldn't get out. And, you know, he shows up, you know, just a minute or two late. Well, and we don't know how late he was because it's movie magic. So, I mean, like she could have been dead for a half an hour. <laughs> You know, and and we don't really know because he showed up there as soon as he was able to, just, you know, save and poor Jimmy from hanging off of that, uh, you know, <laughs> hanging off that uh, that uh, that dam, you know, saving the people of the town, you know, by building that rock dam, like you said, um, you know, and then getting to Lois, and I think it just all got to him, and you can see the pure, it what it was depression, it was sadness at first, and then rage, and like that rage, and he screams up into the air. And what do we see when it screams up in the air? We see Jarrell. No, my son, you must not. You cannot. And he just blows right through, you know, after he says, No, you know, no way, Dad. I'm doing this. And then yeah, we see him start off, and it's the movies, guys. It's you know, it's it's not real life, you know, there's no Superman out there. We can't prove it you know, that you could do it, but he uses what power he has to do to change the direction that our planet is spinning. And in theory, that turns back time. <laughs> now we all know from watching Ferris Bueller that you can't put a car in reverse and turn around the, the odometers. <laughs> so, you know, theoretically, probably not the best awesome plan to, to, to come up with, but it was the seventies. It was movies. It was comic books on film. You know, he had to do something Superman-y or else anybody could do it. And, you know, he had to save Lois. This is what he knew he could do. So for him to fly around, you know, at light speed, practically to, to change the direction of the earth, to turn back time so he could fly down and get Lois before she, you know, suffocates underneath all the rock and gravel, that just had to happen. So accept it, just let it go and just enjoy the movie as what it was. So yeah, him saving her. And then, and then the best, the, one of the best lines is, you know, Oh, there's never a Superman around when you need one after he just turned back time and saved her. And okay, I've got a lot of work to do. So you're going to have to be okay right here for a second. And then she bitches him out, <laughs> you know, and you're just like, you know, you can't win for winning. Right. Now and then Jimmy comes up. He starts complaining too. You know, you could have dropped me off closer. Anywhere, rattlesnakes, everything. <laughs> so it did. It you can't win for losing, like you said. No. Uh, then the of course the final scene is he captures Lex and he drops him off at the prison. He says, uh, "I think you 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 know what to do with these guys." And he drops them off. And the prison warden's like, "Who's that?" And he goes, "I'm Lex Luthor." And he pulls his hair off, and you you see that bald head for the first time. And he's still so regal about it. He gets Lex Luthor, the greatest criminal mind of our generation. That that regalness that you, you I don't care. You've caught me. You've only caught me right now. I'll be out of here in a, in a couple of years. Don't you worry, Superman. Your main nemesis is always going to be here. I will always be here to stop you. And that, or I'll always be here and Clark is in, I'll always be here to stop you. You know, like that, that's, that's the unspoken word between the two of them. And yeah, I mean, he gets dropped off and he's like, well, Mr. Greatest mind of the uh, greatest criminal mind of our century. Your room is this way, <laughs> you know, respect whatsoever. Right. So, yeah. And of course he goes, there hasn't been a prison that can hold me. And so that leads us, that's a very interesting line of dialogue because that leads us into the sequel. Uh, a few years later, we, we get a sequel, uh, Superman 2. Yep. But um, the main thing why we do this show, why I do this show is, what is, what is it about this film? And obviously, Action Comics um, 1000 came out uh, this week. This is going to be recorded around the time Action Comics 1000 came out and and Superman turned 80 years old, even though uh, you're going to be watching it in a few a few weeks later. So, um, but what is it about this film and everything about it that makes this film so essential, Sandy, for, for everybody out there? Oh, okay. So that's a, a great question. And, uh, you know, I'll try to keep it as, as, as succinct as possible. It is... 100% one of the most essential movies that you can watch 
because it brought imagination in my opinion back you know as well as star wars and we talked about that earlier you know but 1977, 1978, 1979 with Star Trek, you, you know, really brought out this hopefulness, this this imagination that this this type of work could be out there for us to watch. And they didn't do it campy. You know, we all know the, you know, the the you know, the early Superman serials and, and movies that were on TV and George Reeves and, and all that kind of stuff. You can do Superman campy, but they didn't. They did it serious. It was a serious movie. It wasn't, oh, this dude just showed up in blue tights and oh, let's all have a little chuckle. Ha ha ha. No, it was a serious movie and people took it serious. And, you know, that's why they had so many good actors in it. Why I think that it's essential to watch is the filmmaking. The, the filmmaking on this movie, the actors, the directing of this movie, and like and like I said, Richard Donner does such an amazing job of, of this movie and, and the next movie that you know it, it's why I consider it's you know at one point we might talk about this too, but um, Superman Two is probably the best sequel movie that's probably ever been made, um, and a lot of that had to do with Richard Donner's directing because most a lot of it was filmed at the same time. Um, which another reason, you know, really didn't happen all that often where you did two movies at the same time. I know it happens a lot nowadays, but it didn't back then. Um, you couldn't wrap people up for that long back then, uh, cause they had, you know, studio contracts and stuff like that to deal with. Um, when you put it all together, the music, the score, the, you know, the, the acting, the actors, um, the directing, uh, the cinematography, everything about it the the the, the editing it, it's 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 so essential to watch it just to say that you've seen it because it's so good and dan was right at the beginning of this folks 100 percent right it, it's it's the granddaddy of what we are enjoying now we're a week out from infinity war you know uh, you know right when we're taping this but we don't have those movies without superman we don't have anything like this without superman something can be said for batman 1989 rekindling you know it all up because we'd had so we we did have some pretty crappy superman movies at the end of the 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 chris reeve cycle so we all know that um but these first two especially this first one really opened opened the door up to let people like a tim burton go they did it with Superman. Why can't we make a serious Batman movie? Why does it have to be Adam West? Nothing wrong with Adam West, but why does it have to be the campy 60s and, and 70s Superman? Why can't, or Batman, why can't it be a serious, dark Batman movie? And we got that. And, it, you know, everybody loves it. It's fantastic. We don't get the Dark Knight trilogy. We don't get the MCU. We don't get the DCEU without this movie. And that, in a nutshell, is exactly why it's essential to watch it. Yeah, I couldn't have said it any better, Sandy. You really captured everything um, that I would have said if I had to have said it about this film and why uh, this film stands up and why it's such an essential film. And that's why we're talking about it today. And that's why I was glad when you nominated it. I was like, wow, this is, yeah, this is a film that should be talked about on the the 52 must-see movies and why they matter. It really stands the test of time, and for so many reasons, it's got, like you said, great direction, great score, great acting, great story. I mean, it's a fun comic book superhero story, um, yep. and and it's it just so happens that we're talking about it on a day that is celebrating Superman with its thousandth issue of Action Comics and the 80th anniversary of the creation of Superman by Simon and Schuster. Um, so, um, Sandy, where can you be found? Uh, you know, you guys all know me by now. You guys all know you can follow me at uh, Full Metal, uh, Full Metal Media, Full Metal Trivia, Worldwide Movie Games, all at uh, YouTube, Facebook, um, Twitter. Uh, you know, find all of those there. We're always uploading content. Dan will be uh, uploading more of these episodes on, onto Full Metal Media. You know, you know, almost all the time. It seems like I. 
I love them so much. These are these are the you're a great host at this, Dan. It's a great idea. I think that it's uh it's it's fantastic to get these out here now. And it doesn't matter that these are all our opinions, and you know, people may disagree that Superman is an essential movie to watch. I don't care. Like this for for what it is, and you know, check this out because it's just fun. Check out all the other episodes that he's done too. They're so great. And it's it if you were looking, if you were just getting into if you're just getting into this space, a list like the 52 most essential movies to watch, guess what? That'll help you. <laughs> you know, you don't just go on to AFI and download their 100 top movies of all time. Make your determination for yourself. Watch the movies you want to watch and something like this gets that out there. I hope that people watch this episode and go, well, damn, I haven't seen Superman in a long time. Man, I, I want to go back and watch it. Or I've never seen Superman. The only Superman that I know is Man of Steel or, you know, or, you know, or whatever else. It's check this stuff out because we have a really good time talking to you guys. And these movies are great, even if they're old like I am. <laughs> I'm right there with you, my friend. Uh, I think I was four years old when this movie came out. Um, so I didn't see it in the theater. I saw it a, a few years later, but I saw it at like six, seven years old. So I didn't see it that long later. But uh, yeah, you can find me at Dan Skip Allen on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and pictures. Also at From the Fourth Row on Twitter. Uh, I also write reviews um, and I'm a film critic. Uh, you can find my reviews at cinesportstalk.com, C I N E S P O R T S T A L K. Dot com if you want to follow me in my reviews and my movie uh, criticism. So for Sandy and myself, good night. <laughs>